It is 19 now with Sergio all across Guyana, and it is time to enter room 592 with Dr. Yog Mahadio alongside senior journalist of Kytra News, Leonard Gildari. This evening, their esteemed guest, Chris Ram, alongside Kamal Ramkaran. Of course, we are awaiting the arrival of Mr. Ram. In the meantime, good evening, gentlemen. Good evening to you, sir. How are you tonight, and how is my co-host, Mr. Leonard Gildari? Leonard, uh, have the boys been making their vouchers available to you, sir? No, unfortunately, like many things in there, and lots of promises uh, no, nobody delivers. Uh, we will continue to agitate in this direction, but in the meantime, uh, elections 2020, uh, we are going to agitate on that. But with regards to the boys in the studio, we'd have to come back to them after this. Maybe they're filing an injunction against you to I stop you from no asking idea, them for their salary. <laughs> injunctions and notices of injunctions seems to be the order of the day. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to room 592, where we unleash the truth. And uh, Tonight, we uh, we will be joined, uh, I'm sure, at some stage with uh, by Mr. Chris Ram. But here in this panel at this moment, let us say hello and welcome to attorney at law, Mr. Kamal Ramkran. Kamal, welcome to room 592, sir. Thank you, Yog, and good evening, Leonard and Yog, and Thank good you, evening, everybody. Good evening. Ladies and gentlemen, let's get on with our show tonight. Remember, this is where the, the truth is unleashed. This is where there is no spin, no political spin. We say it exactly how it is. This platform, ladies and gentlemen, let me remind you, this is not a political platform. It's where we just talk the truth. And in this case, the truth and the micros the, 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 the glasses, the lens, the microscope, the telescope, you name it, it's all focused on politics in Guyana. And so being focused on politics, we are going to talk the truth. Ladies and gentlemen, a lot of things have happened. And this nation, all of us, whether we are living in in the uh, on these shores here, in this land of Guyana, or we are Guyanese living overseas. What has happened? We have almost come a full circle. We have seen every move being made by an illegitimate government to steal and hold on to power at any cost. We have seen undisguised, unbridled attempts to take this country down the road that we never thought we would go towards. We are back in the 1980s where a president determines he must remain in order and he must rig the elections to stay in order. And the courts and everybody seems to be, he thinks that everybody has to sing his tune or don't say anything. Ladies and gentlemen, these are dangerous times. And I've always called it how I see it to be. In 2014, 2015, leading up to those elections, we were opposed to the, the corruption and to some of the things that the last government was doing. And we thought that people voted for a change. And we joined the call and told Mr. Ramatar that he must concede. And we joined the call and said, people, and said, let there be change. But not change for this absolute nonsense not change where there is corruption on top of corruption not change this is no change this is probably rewinding to the 1980s ladies and gentlemen this country demands better and Mr. Granger, sir, you must concede you have lost these elections and you are trying to hoodwink this nation one lie after another, sir. You are trying every which way you can to stay in office. It is not going to work. The people have spoken. And you have lost not just the ballots anymore, sir. You could have gone out as a shining knight. You could have gone out looking good but now sir you will have to leave in shame one day you will have to leave ladies and gentlemen that is the truth and the truth must be said because today today we are back where we were a year ago i want to remind you a year ago Kamal might not agree with me, Leonard might not agree with me. A year ago, a matter went to this Court of Appeal. 
and the Court of Appeal voted that 34 has to be a majority of 65. That matter had to go to the CCJ. And it is that same Court of Appeal that today they have approached to stop Lowenfield from giving his advice of a declaration to the chairman of GCOM. And so, ladies and gentlemen, this, this travesty speaks to the start of a dictatorship if we're not careful. Leonard, I'm sorry, my co-host, I know you are more measured because you are, you are the journalist, you are the senior newspaper man here. I am just the person who runs room 592, and I have my lawyer tonight with me, just in case I say anything. Protection, but, so you don't have any protection here. Absolutely. Uh, but, uh, Kamal, welcome, and uh, sir, if you can, uh, what is this, Kamal? Um, how is it, is this the first time in the world where a party is not going to act because there is a notice to file? There's no injunction, is there, Kamal? Not as far as I know, you. I haven't seen everything. I've seen a document from the, what I've heard from the news. A case has been filed, and I understand that the chief election officer is not acting because this case has been filed. So he's waiting perhaps until the end of the case to determine what he must do. And waiting for the end of the case, I mean, we have known that uh, in the last time, when matters went in front of Madame Roxanne George, she acted with great alacrity and she did what she had to do. But Kamal, um, a technical question for you, sir, just to go back to the last point you made. Is a, a, should a person desist from further action if he's told that there is intent to file? Because at that time, the filing didn't happen yet, or at least the, the filing was not complete in terms of having all the required parts of it. Is, is, is Mr. Lowenfield, ha, has he done the right thing? Well, you know, you're, you're talking about the situation as though this were, we were in reality, but here we, we are in a charade. This is a joke. It is one ridiculous thing after the next until... I don't know what's going to happen. Maybe options are going to run out. And then we're going to pull the mask off and we're going to say, okay, the government is going to stay here no matter what. Because when we run out of legal things to do, then we will start using extra legal things. What I would do if I'm served with documents, I would ask a lawyer, what does this mean? Does it mean that I can no longer go ahead? Let's say I'm building a house or building something or doing something. Does this mean that I have to stop? And the lawyer will look at it. If there is no order which requires me to stop doing what I'm doing, then there's no need for me to stop. Uh, this, this is the most important thing in this country, which has been delayed more than three months. Surely you don't take a set of court proceedings and say, okay, well, there's nothing I can do, when you have the most important job in the country. Mm -hmm. and, and let us just, uh, you know, stay focused on that for a minute. So... As of today, as of 1.30 today, viewers and listeners, I mean, this comment is not directed at Mr. Ram Kuran or my co-host, but, but here is what actually happened. What actually happened was that Mr. Lowenfield was instructed to present his report to the chairman at 1 today. Now, before or at 1, he was told... There was no court document, but he was told that, uh, that a filing would take place in court. So in other words, Lowenfield acted on an unsigned notice from an APNO agent, APNO AFC agent. Unsigned. Unsigned. He just, it's like what uh, one of their agents said, Leonard, it was fair to say. Right? It didn't have the basis of a signature. It didn't have the basis of a court stamp. It didn't have the basis. He received that notice. And he decided, okay, he's not going to move ahead. Now, hear me out with this. Hear me out with this. It gets worse. Just in case, just in case Lowenfield would have gone ahead and still presented his final report, there was a backup plan. Because two commissioners of two of the APNO AFC commissioners did not attend the meeting today. So even if 
Had he presented his final report, there would not have been a quorum. There would not, could not have been a meeting of GCOM. So it, the plot thickens. When you think that it couldn't, it just thickens more and more. And in addition now, so GCOM is obliged, and come out, you will correct me, my narrative is wrong, incorrect in any way. GCOM is obliged, having not gotten a quorum today, to give 24 hours, reschedule that meeting, and if they don't come up for the next meeting, GCOM will proceed. So in the meantime, this court matter steps in, and tomorrow at 1 o'clock or 1.30 thereabouts, the court will now listen. Now, come on. Is the court listening to a motion to determine whether to grant an injunction or not? Is that correct, sir? As far as I've seen from the documents, uh, there are declarations and orders which are sought in terms of uh, what the interpretation of the Constitution must be and so on. I haven't seen, although I might be wrong, I haven't had a chance to look at it really carefully. I might be wrong as to whether there is an application. There's no separate application in documents I saw for an injunction. Mm -hmm. Usually what you do is that you file your case and then you file a separate application to a single judge for a conservatory order or a state of execution to stop what is going on until that case is determined. I haven't seen that sort of application. Mm -hmm. I don't know what was filed and I didn't see it, or I don't know if one was to be filed and I haven't seen it. Okay. So, Leonard, what, I mean, Leonard, from a lay, you being, I mean, I have been fortunate to be, uh, to be, talking to people like Kamal and so forth a little bit. So I learned a few droplets along the way. But from your perspective, as you said today, you do not know the legalese. Leonard, in your mind as a senior journalist, what do you see or what would you want to ask Mr. Kamal Rankaran here to, to explain in terms of this injunction, well, the notice? Well, uh, let's, uh, there's several things that... Before, are... before you um, talk, Leonard, I have the document here, so I can read the orders. We can go through them if, if you want. But okay. just, I, I have it here with me. Okay, we could, we could probably examine it and, uh, and, and see how it goes. But I, I want to ask, um, what could be more important in your mind, uh, uh, Council, that would cause two uh, GCOM commissioners to stay away from a day, like today, from the a commission meeting. I, I'm trying to wrap my head around that, and maybe you might have an explanation as to why uh, or what could be more important that would see you um, being elsewhere other than at the GCOM headquarters secretariat today at 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock. I suppose, I suppose, Leonard, the most important thing for them is that the PPP does not assume office as the government. That is the most important thing in the world to them. And so it's more important than attending GCOM. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Let me welcome, let me welcome, yeah, let me welcome Mr. Chris Ram to our room 592. Mr. Ram, welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, my apologies. I was uh, uh, trying to look for some data. <laughs> we will allow you to make it up to us by appearing on another show very soon, sir. <laughs> Mr. Ram. First, uh, uh, we went through a little bit of the introduction, but I want to throw this immediately at you. Is there any significance, sir, to the layman? To the layman, is there any significance in, in this matter going to the court of appeal, that same court that had to decide that 34 was greater than, uh, was, was an absolute majority? Well, I, I would hope that um, our judges who appeared in that court would have learned their lesson and based some basic maths. Um, I think if you're going on to 177, um, then 177 for then you do go to the Court of Appeal. The, what I find more significant, um, colleagues, is that this is an attempted election petition through the side door. This is a con. This is a fake. This is an, an incompetent attempt to bring an election petition you know, 177.4 is all about the qualification of the president, or the qualification of the election president. You know the word qualification has not been used in any one of the 30 paragraphs in this document. It is that bad. This thing should be thrown out at the first order. That okay. Be, that, 
I, I, I'll be looking with interest at how the Court of Appeal deals with this matter tomorrow. Okay. And Mr. Ram and uh, Kamal, um, you know, I just want to rehash this point. Uh, Mr. Lowenfield received notice that, an, uh, that a matter is being taken to court and he refused to move further and GCOM refused to move further. Is that regular? Is that, uh, is there uh, another way that GCOM and they and Lowenfield could have approached this? Mr. Ram? Well, look, you know, we really got to stop pretending that there is anything logical or legal or decent about what's happening. This is one big conspiracy. I would not be surprised if they all knew what each other was doing. Um, the two persons, the person from the um, Desmond Trotman and Charles Corbin didn't turn up, but Vincent Alexander, who seems to be the spokesperson for the three, he did, knowing full well that they could not have a meeting. Mm -hmm. Lowenfield probably know that and knew that as well. This whole thing has become such a catastrophic farce and a shame on this country that, quite frankly, I'm not sure, and I, I'm not usually a pessimist, uh, whether this country could ever, ever recover from this, from what is taking place. People at the highest level, I can't say I'm particularly impressed by the Court of Appeal setting the matter for tomorrow, when the Court of Appeal knows that under Article 177, I think it is, the same article, GCOM not having had a quorum this afternoon should have had its meeting tomorrow and in which it would dispatch whatever matter before it. Mm -hmm. So the court itself must have known. I have other problems. The chance, I would, I'm not sure if the chancellor is going to sit, probably. Um, I, know, I know Kamal is far more um, reserved and polite than I am. Uh, this, the, the chancellor is the person who is going to be swearing in the president. I'm not even sure that it would be proper for her to be appearing in this matter. Oh, she could she could have set aside it. As she did. There, she mm -hmm. did um, in a recent matter. Mm -hmm. And Very perhaps bring, the, bring um, Chief Justice Robson George. Mm -hmm. Very interesting point there, Mr. Ram. Um, Kamal, is the... This this matter has uh, I mean the parties are Eslin David and uh, the the other side is the chief elections officer the chairman the commission itself and the AG the attorney general um, why why the AG is one and two how will the PPP whose interest is also involved in this will how can they become part of this this action? Or, or this this court um, uh, appearance tomorrow? Well, well, I assume they're going to show up and ask for leave to intervene and to file an affidavit and answer and to be heard. And this is a matter, of course, of national importance. It concerns them. Courts are not going to shut them out. Courts have wide powers to allow people when, when it affects their interests. But the matter is not going to be heard and determined tomorrow unless the court says this matter is absolutely ridiculous and we are going to throw this out immediately. What happens is that there may be an application to intervene. You might have to file documents to show your entitlement to intervene. Or if there is not that application, you might be able to intervene right away. But you still have to answer it. And then the applicant still has to put uh, legal arguments forward. And then the other parties have to put legal arguments in answer. So this is not something that's going to end tomorrow, unless, of course, they, they throw it out without mm -hmm. even one mm -hmm. Which, in my opinion, is very, very unlikely to happen. Correct. Well, Chris, um, the Roxanne George, when she was the person that would have heard the earlier um, uh, the, the matters against Mingo, she acted with great alacrity. I mean, she worked through weekends. I remember it was Agua, uh, some holiday. Was it Agua? Time thieves seems so long now. Yeah. But she worked through holidays, worked through weekends to ensure that the, the hearings happen. Uh, my question to you, Chris, 
Is there a possibility that if the PPP is not part of these proceedings, somehow or the other, that GCOM may or may not put up a, an appearance and, and then, the, then one side just goes ahead with what it wants? Um, I am informed that the Court of Appeal has already given um, permission for Irfan Ali and Barrow Jack Deal to be respondents in this matter. Mm -hmm. And I was told that by one of their counsel. Okay. So, okay. at least that much we don't need to speculate on. Correct. There, there are lots of other things that I think are really very serious. And mm -hmm. it could, you, you know, since the, and uh, let me thank Kamal for uh, appearing pro bono. I'm not sure whether we got our course, Kamal. Um, <laughs> yeah. of, we have. <laughs> <laughs> um, since then, we were saying that you had a government, APNU AFC, including WPA, um, Justice for All, um, whatever else, that simply were, was not prepared to give up power. We had all kinds of shenanigans, oh, you must test the law and the law provides for this, we are now saying what the whole objective and idea was. Takumo Gonsei said at the Commission of Inquiry, Bornham said, if you have whatever you have to do when it comes to elections, you do them. And what we are saying here now, it is successors to Bornham, just abusing the Constitution in the cruelest, cruelest manner. And you have Granger. I would not be surprised if Granger said, you know, I have no influence over the court. I have no influence over GCOM. He has influence over himself. Granger can do the decent thing and say, I concede. But Granger is not prepared to put the interests of the country ahead of his own narrow, petty interests. And mm -hmm. really, I think it's about time we, we call out these guys, including Ramjatana who double speaks and triple speaks because they are destroying not only the democratic fabric of our country but the social fabric the, the interpersonal relationship just about everything that makes guyana a great place not just a good place a great place they are destroying every element of it and you know after today as I said, you one has to be pessimistic about the future of this. I want to yeah. ask you, uh, uh, Mr. Ram, if it might be a good idea for uh, the opposition or the People's Progressive Party to go ahead now and file an application for the recusal of uh, the Chancellor. I, I would probably defer to Kamal on that point. Come on. I don't think the Chancellor is going to say. The Chancellor is aware that, that um, she has certain obligations in terms of swearing in and so on. I don't think she will sit. And even if she did sit, I mean, I, I, the swearing in is a formal act. It, it, it's not, there's nothing in the law about swearing in. Once a declaration is made, the President is entitled to have himself sworn in. And even if a President were not sworn in officially, the President would be the President once the declaration were made. Mm -hmm. The only the only point about that, though, I, and I, I agree totally there, is that he, he can't perform any function as president unless he's taking, yeah, so he takes it, yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. and, and just go on. Go. Last case, yo, before you go on, in the last case that was before the court, this was um, Yulita Moore, I think, in the Court of Appeal. Mm -hmm. The Chancellor didn't say, mm -hmm. perhaps because of the same reason. Right. Interesting. Just, just as an aside, um, I think the the uh, the attorney, um, Mr. Robertson, um, I think he was uh, the same person, Leonard, from a journalist. Uh, I, we are getting a feedback from somewhere. But um, Mr. Robertson, I think the attorney at law was an independent candidate in the last local government elections, wasn't he, Leonard? 
I think that is what we're hearing. We're trying to get some confirmation out of it, um, but we would have mm -hmm. heard that. Uh, so um, uh, I'm not sure you're uh, supposed to get a confirmation, so I'm going to get back. Right. I think, you know, he had contested on behalf of large Durban backlands, Meadowbrook Gardens, etc., etc. But it's interesting. And um, I heard him speak to one of the, well, not one of, he, he was speaking on the APNO AFC uh, live feed. And he was uh, convinced that he has a solid case. I guess any attorney at that stage would say so. But he was convinced that he had a solid case. And he, he cast aside any, uh, well, you know, the, the questions were pointed. He cast aside any, any hope that might exist in the opposition camp. Uh, Kamal, uh, in terms of, of, of the next steps, if this thing is not done, if the court doesn't throw it out tomorrow, what might be the timelines we're looking at now? Because this country has been waiting 107, 108 days already. The court has to know this. Mm -hmm. well, you know, this is a very, very simple issue. This, this case doesn't need more than uh, 20 or 30 minutes to be argued. Mm -hmm. The first question is, does Article 177, 4 or 5, whichever the case is, is uh, 4, does Article 177, 4, allow somebody to come to the court for this sort of relief that they're asking for. And it doesn't. Because as Chris said, it, Article 177.4 speaks about qualifications. The Court of Appeal shall have exclusive jurisdiction to hear and determine any question as to the validity of an election of a president in so far as that question depends upon the qualification of any person for election. So mm -hmm. qualifications mm -hmm. for election are set out in Article 90 of the Constitution, mm -hmm. which says, I, I'll get it for you in a second. Mm -hmm. Article 90 of the Constitution says, a person shall be entitled, shall be qualified for election as president and shall not be qualified unless he or she is a citizen of Guyana, is Guyanese by birth or parentage, B is residing in Guyana on the date of nomination for election, is continually residing therein for a period of seven years immediately before that date, and C is otherwise qualified to be elected as a member of the National Assembly, which means not to be a citizen, sane, and so on. So Correct. that is what qualifications are. That is why you go to the Court of Appeal. And as Chris also said, this is, a, this is an election petition in disguise. Now the High Court has exclusive jurisdiction to hear questions about the validity of elections regarding the qualification of any person to be elected as a member of the National Assembly and whether elections have been lawfully conducted and that sort of thing. So, mm -hmm. this court of appeal jurisdiction is a very, very special jurisdiction and it deals only with qualifications. The case is not about qualifications. Though. The case is about valid votes, what we've been hearing all the time, about whether the votes are valid and so on. Mm -hmm. So, it, it shouldn't take more than half an hour. How long have I taken? Five minutes? <laughs> it take more than half an hour to, to dispose of this case. Uh, but but then uh, let me ask the silly question: If the court throws it out, um, would the appellant have uh, uh, another court to approach, or could they now do something else with that same thing, or that's it? Well, the section itself says that the court of appeal should be the final court, but uh, this was probably it. I don't see a marginal note to one seventy seven five to, to see whether it was. Passed before or after um, the, the CCJ so uh -huh. before the CCJ came into force. So right. there is a CCJ, and in a matter of this importance, you would go, of course, to the CCJ, whether or not, whatever the article says. CCJ mm -hmm. will determine whether your right to appeal is there or not. And I, I would say that you can't shut the um, CCJ out just like that. You go to mm -hmm. one course, and that's the end of the matter. All right. And Chris, uh, the country remembers, because it was all going live during the case that uh, when they appeared in front of Roxanne George in, in the beginning of this, this process here. And Roxanne George took, was at pains to say, I cannot deal with that. That is a matter for election petition. You know, she, she was very explicit and expressive on, on, on chastising when she had to, any of the attorneys that tried to to bend her will towards looking to something that might be more of an election's petitions. Um, Chris, what's your thought in terms of what Kamal just said and with regards to how the courts will approach this? Are we, is there anything we're missing? If this thing is so narrow, 
as Kamal said, that it is looking as uh, at 177, but from the perspective of qualification, right. uh, are they making, is there something we're not seeing here? Well, let's look at it. They have tried just about everything. We know when we were in school, what they told you about a drowning person. They are clutching. And you clutch at the most unreasonable or implausible possibility. They, so what can they do? You, you're quite right, um, Chief Justice Roxa George kept emphasizing it. And in, indeed, on that occasion, it was the Council Boston who kept mm -hmm. repeating that mantra as well, because then it suited his purpose. So um, I, can't, I can't say it, I shouldn't say it again, that this, I don't see any case. Just look at 197.4, and you know, you can see, no matter how many times you read it, it's not, it's not going to, to say anything else, 177.4. Um, the Court of Appeal shall have, and I may disagree with um, Kamal there, because if you don't take exclusive here, Kamal, how do you deal with it with the election petition? Can you say an election petition can go up to the CCG as well? I'd be afraid of that. But it talks about to hear and determine any question as to the validity of an election insofar as that question depends upon the qualification of any person or election or the interpretation of the constitution, which must means in relation to the, um, the validity of his election. That's all it means. And nothing, if you look at the, if we were to turn, if I was to turn, at the, the first, what the grounds for the application, a declaration has failed to act in accordance. What has that got to do with, with any qualification of the president. Let's look at the second one. And this one bothers me, um, given the Court of Appeals recent experience. More votes cast in, you know, you're talking, you're talking about numbers in a court that has distinguished itself for an absurd decision in relation to arithmetic. So maybe they'd have the same problem in this case. And if you look at every single one of these paragraphs, you get you you realize that this this case really has no merit. One restraining the chief election officer, receiving the chief election. That's all they are. Where is anything about the qualification to um, to be president? Nowhere at all. I should point out uh, before going on that it does also say that it in uh, qualification of president. Or election or the interpretation of this constitution but as chris has said that has to be limited to qualification of the president you don't go to the court of appeal which has exclusive jurisdiction and no appeal there from for an interpretation of the constitution it has to be read in terms of interpretation of this constitution in terms of the qualification of any person mm -hmm. president. so what what this as i went through section 90 with you what do those things mean section 90 citizen of parentage and so on Right. So, 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 gentlemen, if I may um, go down this path. Now, if, as you are both, uh, you know, giving us your opinion here, that this matter seems to be one that ought to be thrown out, um, you know, in a jiffy, um, why, why then? I mean, Chris, you said that they're clutching at straws, but this buys you, what, 24 hours, and then what? I mean... That's my other worry. What else are we not seeing? I know this calls for speculation, which we shouldn't be doing too much. But, you know, you have to be prepared. Uh, Leonard and I have been on radio for 105 days. And always, every day, telling people it's tomorrow, it's tomorrow. So, we want to know, Leonard, what next? What next, Kamal? Well, I don't know. I, I, I want to come in here. Um, and yeah. then Lyle would have filed an application reportedly last week in anticipation of a stay against the declaration. I want to ask you, gentlemen, uh, what kind of impact this court case uh, that was filed today is going to have on that filing by Anne Landland? Do we know? I think he wrote asking to be heard if anything had been filed before an oh, order was granted. Okay. That, that, mm -hmm. that was as far as I've seen in the press. Mm -hmm. So, okay. so Anna, 
I, we haven't heard that he has received any notice in the press. So I'm assuming that means that no injunction has been granted. No order has been made. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Do we have any idea if the PPPC has been included um, in this matter here? Who, who are the respondents? Well, well, Chris said earlier that he did get information that they have been allowed to, to be included. Okay, okay. Or they have been asked to include. Because it, so. Ananda was saying that they were not. All right, good. Okay. Um, so, so, Chris, what's your thoughts? I mean, I'm sure, sorry to ask you to speculate, but uh, as a legal man and as an accountant, you would always be planning and making prudent thoughts about the future. So, <laughs> how prudent can we be as a people to look up to tomorrow? Well, as you said just now, you, you and, and Leonard have a lot of experience. <laughs> Yes. Huh? <laughs> and all you will say is tomorrow and tomorrow never comes. <laughs> but oh boy. You know, but, we're, we're trying to make sense of something that is really farcical. Make mm -hmm. an issue of a of a country that is a pantomime. And you know, we forget we have the COVID-19. We have a, um, a treasury that is bare. We don't have a parliament. We have a major case concerning the territorial integrity of this country. A major issue. It's not a direct case. Coming up, we don't really have a government that can go out and say, speak to the people. It's not legitimate. So, this APNU AFC, which is the PNC in disguise. It's just the PNC. And what people, uh, all of them have now come over to that. Your friend, um, Yoga, I'm not accusing you, um, but your friend Ramjatan. These people are destroying our country. And I don't know who has any influence. You talk to people and say, boy, you know. PNC is Aubrey Norton and, and Walter Lawrence and, and that lot that is in total control. But you mentioned you mentioned one of the names there. Uh, you know, I don't I don't I don't want to define. But but Leonard, um, you and I got information that some of these ministers have already packed up and, and moved out of their offices. So um, it, it boggles. Uh, you know, it's mind boggling that some of and if I may, gentlemen, I, I want to use this platform here. I want to call on on the good the good people within the PNC and the good people within the AFC. Ladies and gentlemen, you need to now stand up and save your party because this embarrassment, everyone will have to live with it. We are not going to have we are not going to have a good opposition in Parliament because when the PPP gets sworn in it will be just the PPP because every time a harm on or every time anybody from the PNC opens their mouth, this shame they will have to live under all the time. How can we expect a good opposition? So if there are decent men and women remaining within the PNC and the FC, I am calling on you, stand up, speak out, control and save your party. If not, all is lost. Come out. When this matter, let's just make an assumption, let's accept assumption one, that the, the court throws this thing out tomorrow. Um, is there, sir, any other, any other limb of the law, any other section, anything else that another injunction can be sought on the law? Because after the court is finished, then GCOM will take its own jolly good time to call another meeting which might be another 24 hours. That means two commissioners will not attend that one, which gives them another day, so we're into next week now. I mean, we can read the play, right? Next week now, we're gonna have another meeting. And, and so you're at the middle of next week, and Mr. Lowenfield then decides he's gonna be sick. What? <laughs> it, it sounds funny, but it is so serious, come on. Well, well you know, you know, the chairman did give him only two days, I believe. Was it two days or was it a day to provide a report? It was two days, but oh, yeah. wasn't it wasn't it two months? I mean, all he had to do was take the same one section of his preliminary report, which is the numbers, and then do the allocation of the National Assembly. It was simple, but you know, maths is not simple for some guys. 
I mean, that should have been an eight-hour. As far as I'm concerned, the issue is a very, very simple issue. If you look at Article 177, one of the Constitution, it's, and it has been floating around a lot, it says very clearly what has to happen. There are three elements. The first element is more votes cast for one list than the others, right? We all know what the recount says. We all know that more votes have been cast in favor of one list than in favor of the others. So know which list that is. Now, the president, presidential candidate from the list with more votes is deemed elected as president, and there are two things that have to happen. One, the chief election officer has to advise the chairman, or, and the chairman has to declare the person president. So all of this is contingent on the more votes being cast for less. The person who has more votes is entitled to the advice to go a certain way, and is entitled to the declaration to go a certain way. So the chief election officer has a duty to give his advice in a particular way that says more votes have been cast in favor of this list and in favor of the other list. And the chairman has a duty to declare the person who has the most votes uh, elected president. So this is a very, very, very simple issue. Again, it, it should not take more than five minutes in a normal normal country, but we, we are no longer in a normal country, as Chris said, and as I said earlier on, we have, uh, and I said it on a show, one of you shows you, we, we have gone through the, the looking glass. We are now in the looking glass world, where nothing goes according to the way it's supposed to go. Everything is different. Chris, um, supposing the low and field, even after, assume, with the assumption that the court throws this matter out tomorrow, Suppose Lowenfield then abdicates on his duty. You know, it's, it's sad that you would ask a question like that. Because here it is, you have a person who holds one of the most sensitive positions in the country at this time. And we are speculating with good reason that that person may, may abdicate his his function that's a tragedy now you know social media was active today you hear that um that roxanne myers the deputy chief election officer would also refuse um i don't know whether they would take this approach that the chairperson, the chairperson must have had a working look this thing here is a simple spreadsheet exercise, and I don't want to use it in a mingo sense. But it's, you have your 10 regions, you have your votes cast, you have your total, you have your allocation, um, how many votes constitute a whole seat, and then you work it through, and you deduct the regional seats. This, this worksheet is already there. I believe in advance of March the 2nd, that worksheet would have been taken out, checked to see that there are no bones that had infected it, and it works. We've had these elections, we had nine of the ten regions. So we had, we had everything. It's the speculation as to what will happen. Um, I'm not sure, and I'll be guided by, by Kamal, I've known occasions when a judge is asked for something urgent and he doesn't want, he needs to get around passing it through his registrar to go down to the Supreme Court registrar to get it entered. I said, look, I will take responsibility for making that entry. Mm -hmm. I don't see why the chairperson, again, using, is it section 22 of the, the Elections Amendment Act? of 2000, says that, look, to remove any um, difficulties, I believe was the word that was used, this is, is a fertile case for the exercise of that special arrangement. It's nothing illegal, it's transferred. Here, here are the numbers. Now, maybe the chairperson should say, look, I am sending, I am getting my, because she must have a secretariat, herself, a uh, couple of secretaries perhaps, have that working and send it to the chief election officer and say, look, 
on the basis of the recount. This is the allocation of the seats, and this is the al this is the meaning of the greater number of votes. That's all that has to happen. So I don't see why it should be done. So look, we're over what, what now? We 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 almost getting to 110 days. That's that's not good for our country. We we operate sometimes at such a low level of performance. You only know that this country is in lockdown. Correct. But Chris, we have been operating this way for, for much more than 110 days, ladies and gentlemen. It's since the no confidence motion. I want to ensure we do not forget these things. From the, the night, the, the night following the no confidence motion, Moses Nagamutu, greater them all came out and said, we will have to abide. The government lost the confidence motion in, in the National Assembly and we have to go to elections. One day later, this, this mathematical uh, nonsense started and it took us months, a whole year, to be told 33 is greater than 32 over 65. Ladies and gentlemen, the, the CCJ deemed the incumbent as a caretaker government on September 30th, 2019. Immediately thereafter, you continue to see cavalier attitude in government. You continue to see the duty-free concessions. You continue to see all kinds of things being done with taxpayers' money. Today, $69 billion world we're in. People are starving in this country with COVID-19. Not one peep, not one word from a government that used to share party tickets before the elections. Not one meal now. Yet they continue. They continue to earn a salary that is being paid for by you and I as taxpayers in this country. I want to make sure, let us all remember that. After March 2nd, 2020, there are ministers and officers, political appointments that continue to steal your taxpayers' money under their name of, of, of having a ministerial job because they do not have the mandate of the people anymore. So ladies and gentlemen, we have to remember this and let us remember the next government must not get it easy. We got to stand up as a people. Sorry to carry on uh, in front of my and our members, but this thing is getting us all going. <laughs> Come on. Hypothetical. If on whatever day, if on next week Monday, next week Tuesday, the chairman still does not receive these numbers, Chris is saying the chairman has a, a right within her own right to make a decision. What can we tell the Guyanese people or what do we think? Is it a clear path that the chairman can put this to a stop, can bring this to an end? Well, you know, um, you know Chris has much more experience than I do in human relations. But this That's seems why I asked you. Human relations matter. <laughs> this seems to me to be a human relations matter. You have somebody who refuses to do their job, then you need somebody else to do the job. Simple as that. If the next person also refuses to do the job, then you find somebody else to do the job. But somebody has to do the job that the law requires to be done. The law is clear. The law says what has to be done. Somebody has to do it. Mm -hmm. So if one well, person must do it. You got to get somebody else to do it. I want to. But, but doesn't that throw us into a time loop again? Doesn't throw? Doesn't that throw? Aren't we us there already? You know, aren't we there already? Because I'm right? sure. I'm sure on the monopoly board that they're looking at, they are seeing that they're buying time with this court action. When this court action is finished, they're seeing that they're going to buy some other time with, with low and fields resignation or low and field falling sick. Uh, you know, I really wanted, I'm tempted to call the, the Georgetown Hospital and say, please be on notice. You will, you may get a patient soon and, and treat them well and get them out of there quickly. Because here is what my worry is. It was sickness that got us the, the, the spreadsheet. And then it was mental sickness maybe that got us from spreadsheet to bed sheet. And today, 108 days later, we're nowhere. So come on, what happened? I mean, I, I don't know. I'm putting you gentlemen at a difficult spot, but 
the chairman does not seem to be or has not exhibited the wherewithal to be proactive, to take decisions and take them strongly. Are we being harsh to tell the chairman, come on, you can put an end to this, come on. Well, according to the CARICOM report, she is doing a tremendous job and there is a lot of pressure on both sides. We ourselves don't know what is happening, where she's concerned. We don't know what she's doing and what she's saying. She hasn't been very expressive. She hasn't come and held press conferences and told us minute by minute this is happening and that is happening, as perhaps we've been accustomed to. But, but we really don't know what sort of pressures she's under. And it may be her personality that she tries to get things resolved in, in a in a sort of way like that, consensus and so on. So mm -hmm. we don't know, but, but we are already in this time loop and how can you hold as anyone's guess? So, uh, yes, yes, please, please. It's no doubt that the, that the chairperson has a very difficult job. And I do, I owe a vast depth of gratitude to President Granger for deeming me unfit to be chairman of the Elections Commission. Thank you, David Granger. Um, but a lot of the problems she's having are due to her own making. She has been so indecisive. She's been, she's maybe tried to pacify the alliance. And now she's realizing, well, you don't do that. So we must, she's a human being, as, as um, Kamal said, we, we have to see the human side of it. But she's performing a public function. She's costing this country millions of dollars. I heard a figure of $500 million just after recount exercise. Mm. That's a lot of money. Now, what can she do? Article 162 says the Election Commission shall have such functions, etc. Um, including issuing such instructions and take such action as appear to it necessary or expedient to ensure impartiality, fairness, and compliance with the provisions of this Constitution or of any Act of Parliament on the part of persons exercising powers of performing duties connected with or relating to the matters of horses, that is talking to, to Lowenfield, mm -hmm. it is talking to Myers, it's talking to Claudette Singh. Yeah. You know, we, we just like how we, we, we've gone after the chairman on so many occasions, I, I, and I, I admit I'm one. We've gone after this constitution as well, but the constitution is, is turning out in many, many areas to be extremely robust. There it, it is, what the chairperson can do. And it's not that she doesn't know. She, she, she had to test some of the section, articles of this constitution. She knows them. She's, she's had a lot of time to refresh. So what can she do? Just apply 162. And right. I want to come in here, uh, uh, Council, uh, maybe for both of you guys. What are some of the options for the people of Guyana with regards to possible criminal actions or civil actions against uh, stakeholders, be it uh, law and field, Mingo? Could you walk us through a little on that? Well, Chris is known for filing private criminal charges, so perhaps we'll ask him to address <laughs> that one. Oh, showing deference to people much older than ourselves. I mean, really. <laughs> no, one hopes. Look, we have seen Walter Lawrence sign a false declaration. Mm -hmm. We have seen Mingo sign a false declaration. So we now are saying that Lowenfield has issued a completely misleading, if not false, and fraudulent uh, report. So surely the state has a duty to protect itself and the people from all these acts of illegalities. But yes, if, um, if Kamal would be my pro bono counsel, I'd be willing to consider bringing private criminal charges. So there's my invitation, come on. 
I don't know much about criminal law, but surely there is there's a tort called misfeasance in public office. Public office, that's right. <laughs> and that's a criminal right. that's a criminal charge? That's that's a civil case, a civil, civil case, case. Misfeasance in public office. Kamala and join in that too, as long as it's pro bono, mind you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, let me just pause for a minute to call out Mr. Mark Justice. That name, sorry, it's not a person, Mr. Mark Justice. I've checked your Facebook page. You're just a photo, a photo of an, an unfortunate thing. But you are on this Facebook page and you're making death threats. Please, sir, if you do not like the discussion, you can go to where there is a discussion you like. That is your right. But please, if you stay here, be human. Thank, you, Thank you. And if you can't be human, we are going to block you. Yes, Leonard. Yes, thank you very much. And let, let us repeat, the station A will not tolerate. Uh, I've been instructed by management, and of course we've been monitored by the Guyana National Broadcasting Authority uh, that there could be no racism, no any charge kind of language that is going to come across here that is going to uh, cause us to be blocked or sanctioned. So we got to be very careful. This is a, a top. These topics here for mature people for Guyana that we want to bring to another level very quickly. And that is what we intend to do and foster. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So Kamal and, and Mr. Ram, again, I mean, we want to come back and I have another hypothetical um, thing for you. Uh, in terms of the, the chairman, Kamal, you said it's a wait, it's a time time game. But, but is there any relief that the people of Guyana can now seek? After having put to wait for so long and seeing one machination, one thing after the other, is there any way that the people of Guyana can now seek uh, the court or seek some office to, to ask GCOM to get on with it? Well, anything that is done would, would be lengthening the time. We are at the end of the process. We simply have to have that advice given to the chairman and the declaration made, and we are at the end of the process. But it, it seems that that we are not getting there. Um, cases, the can be filed. cases can be filed. Uh, Irfan Ali would, would have a good case, a good cause of action to say that the chief election officer had a duty, a duty to give that advice. The, he would have a good case to say that the chairman has a duty to grant that declaration. And he would have a good case to say he has an entitlement to be declared president of Guyana. So that case can be filed. But any case that was filed would, would obviously take some time and lengthen the process. Right. Chris, there is this monumental case coming up at the, the end of this month that you pointed to earlier um, at, at the International Court for our border issues. One of our viewers would have asked the question that, you know, what danger is Guyana in um, not having a government in place if, that's still, if this still stretches out till then? Um, will it have an impact on the case and how does it make us look in the light of, in the eyes of the IC in the International Court? Uh Let's let's put it in context. What we have is only the international court considering the jur jurisdictional issue. There is no big hearing, and also I think our legal team is intact. I believe um, the former foreign minister. I'm not sure. One has never know what he is these days. But the foreign secretary. Um, Carl Greenwich is still heading the country. Uh, country's um, administrative arrangements with that, and and you've got Sri Lanka. So, what I think is it, just psychological. Here it is: you have a party. Well, maybe you have two parties who are one is a one is an international pariah. And the other one is on the verge of becoming one. So, you know, how do we look and how do these judges think about, look, let them fight it out maybe. The, 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 um, the old fashioned cowboy way of you, you meet in the field somewhere with swords. Is that what we're going to do? Because we ourselves as a country are stepping out of the norms of being a democracy, you know. And when you talk about courts, you know, and gentlemen, we are talking about the rule of law. 
And what you have is David Granger hypocritically talking about, I observe this and I observe that. I have said David Granger has violated the Constitution of Ghana more than all the other presidents combined, including President Forbes, including Forbes Burnham. So if we're talking about the rule of law, we're going to the World Court to talk about the rule of law. We're talking about the 1896-99 agreement and what are we doing we have the constitution of guyana and david granger is prepared to violate this at the cost of every single guyanese and at the cost of our country and every single guyanese born and not yet born not yet born mm -hmm. you know you talked about you talked to i think kamal was was asked us some about um what what relief the paradox or the, the, the unfortunate situation, any relief we as citizens get come out of the state to which we as citizens have to contribute. What I would like to see, you see that foolishness that my Robinson has filed, mm -hmm. he should be made to pay some serious, serious costs. Lawyers have to understand that you don't mess with the country just because you want to play cheap politics. And that is what Robinson is doing. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Chris. Ladies and gentlemen, I just would like to use this opportunity too, um, to call out, to call out on a number of persons. I would like to ask the Justice for All Party. Justice for All Party, you need to speak out. Are you in agreement with what is going on here? You need to speak out. The National Democratic Front, the National Front Alliance. Of course, we know the PNC running things presently. Of course, we know that some of the spokespersons for uh, the WPA have taken on their own chime and charm and calling on people to burn ballot boxes and so forth, and we cannot tolerate that. Um, but, you know, the WPA, the Guyana Association of Local Authorities, Action Party, National Congress, um, not people's, the Guyana National Congress and the Guyana People's Partnership. Yeah. To all of these small parties that are in the coalition, L Leonard, I want to put this to you as a senior journalist. Sir, if all of these parties form a coalition that is currently holding this country at ransom, if they do not speak out now, then it means they are party to this wickedness, isn't it? Well, there, there's only one conclusion, and, and when they would have gone to the populace in 2015, asking them to vote, I could remember uh, that the uh, Alliance for Change, uh, I think even Cameron Ramsdan would have made it very clear that he's not going to stand by and see uh, the people who have voted for his party um, as part of the coalition uh, that they're going to be taken advantage of. He's going to be very independent and independently minded. Um, so, of course, you if you use that as an example by extension, uh, the other parties, uh, you rightfully pointed out WPA almost dead. Um, Desmond Trotman is a commissioner within uh, GCOM there. Um, and you look at others. I, I don't know. If you ask a normal man in the street about those other small parties, they probably can't tell you. I think 90% of the people will, would not be able to tell you who are the representatives for that for those parties. So, um, but they, they need to come but, out but, but they, are, to. they are going over the cliff, aren't they? I mean, the PNC is taking them over the cliff, like what it took. Uh, the PNC has entered into a symbiotic relationship with, uh, with the AFC. So when one dies, the other will. But the rest of this, the, the rest of the coalition are all equally dead. If they cannot speak out now, then they can never represent justice, law, constitution, or what is right. And the Guyana Human Rights Association, the transparency, whatever it's called of Guyana, they have all lost it. When it matters most, those religious organizations, I come from a religious organization and I call them out. Those religious organizations that cannot see that this is the time to speak up because your children are going to suffer, then shame on you. And for all those small parties within the coalition, if you are part of this charade, if you are part of this shameless aim, to, to become a dictatorship in Guyana, then shame on you, and the population must never forget forget you. Mr. C.N. Sharma, sir, I have respect for you. Speak up 
and all of you from the coalition speak up now or forever you will not be forgiven. I'm sorry, gentlemen. Coming, coming back to coming back to this, uh, uh, Chris. Uh, I, I did that. Um, I, I think the society needs to speak out. I mean, Chris, you yourself have been uh, proactive in terms of wanting to help, uh, you know, young persons, wanting to help persons with political aspirations to, to, to create a platform and move on. What does Mr. Christopher Ram think of the WPA or the, the, the Justice for All and, or any of those parties? Because you yourself would have been... Uh, on the one side, attacking corruption and attacking senseless nepotism and, and all of that in past governments. You know, behind the scenes as well, one keeps trying. I remember in the very early days, I met Savitri Sharma at um, Gifland Mall, and I tried to appeal to her. I, I, I tried to talk to Sian Sharma. And let's face it. They did call for a recount, but after that they went dead. They've got the recount now that they call for, and apparently that's it. Well, they, they, they can't, that's not what I intended when I spoke with them. I'm in regular contact with Jai Paul Sharma, I regard him as a friend. Um, as we castigate so many people, we must not forget. The courage of Dominic Gaskin from very early o'clock to speak mm -hmm. to the AFC. And um, this is a name we may not be too familiar with. Roy Kanai of the WPA Overseas Group. <laughs> the paradox is it. He called for the WPA to, to come out of the of this APNU AFC. Uh, if we can't solve this election dispute. And what do we do? Desmond Trotman, whilst he's being paid, stayed away to make a political statement. These hypocrites don't know that this is not about politics. When you're elected to constitutional possession positions, you, you take an oath to uphold, you, you, you pledge to uphold the constitution of Guyana. Not the party that appointed you, but they all forget that, and, and that's the tragedy. Each of these persons, we talk about who are guilty, and Alexander did, did some law in Russia, he must know. There is something called fiduciary obligation. They all own obligation to the people of Guyana. They are paid out of the public funds, not of the PNC funds or the APNU funds or the WPA funds. We pay them, and then they turn around and try to strangle us, put their knees on our necks, to rob us of our freedom, to, to, to throw away the constitution of Ghana. That's what they do. And I like your impassion plea, Yoga. I think, I think we have to do something. The, the church is, where are they? They're dead silent. That's a very good question. The... The, the Transparency Institute, Consumers Association. Human rights. Human rights. I, I even have to say about association. At this stage, we expected, and we expect all of these players, particularly given their special role in civil society, to say, look, we cannot go down this road. Let's think of the consequences on Guyana, of the problems in the 60s. Do we want to go back there? Whilst our, our environment is being destroyed, our oil is being produced and shipped, our lumber is going over bauxite, and look what we're fighting for. WPA was once a noble party. A couple of days ago, it celebrated, for, for, it observed 40 years of the assassination of Rodney. They come over and say, wants to change that now. He said, we say that Gordon did that. He, brief, he briefed me as a WPA lawyer, the Commission of Inquiry, about how Gordon was, was, um, had his hands involved in the death of Walter Rodney. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. this election, but we mustn't blame the election, has really rendered our society back for decades.
And it's all because, in my view, all because we misunderstood the true nature of the PNC. And the PNC has not changed. It has never subscribed to free and fair elections. It has always been a struggle. I think of, on all occasions, maybe the 2006, I was out there outside the Elections Commission in 1992. We've been witnessing violence. We know who are there. The PNC does not mean to change. It is saying, if we can't rule Guyana, then you can't. That's right. And we'd rather be the king over the ashes than be a, a, a citizen over a, a, a civilized country. That's, the, that's what we are facing with. We have all tried to reach out to the APNU AFC. But we have seen their true colors. We've seen Granger move from one storyline to another. And every time he, he, he has lost a regular room. Correct. We, and we're endangering, as I said, the future of our country. I don't know um, how much more an old man like me in my mid-70s almost have any influence on anybody. But we have to try Absolutely. There's a comment here coming from, uh, I think, a local. Good evening, gentlemen. There's no need to worry about tomorrow's hearing. Article 1, sentence 7, 4 can only be triggered after the president has been elected because the article clearly provides that there's the election of the president which can be challenged either upon his qualification or upon the interpretation of the constitution. I think this is um, a, a stem or a branch off from what... Um, um, Mr. Kamal would have said a little earlier. Well, it, the article says the validity of an election of a president. So, has the president been elected? The person has a point. Has the president been elected? There is no declaration. So, can it can it be said that the person has been elected? The the Constitution one seventy seven one says. The president, presidential candidate is deemed to be elected. But elections are not over until that declaration is made. So that, I suppose, would be a valid argument. Um, I am neither here nor there on it because the presidential candidate has been deemed to be elected because we know more votes have been cast in favor of one party. So that, that deeming has happened. And we now only wait for the advice and the declaration. But it is an argument which can be taken. And quickly, gentlemen, my question, let's assume that the court, uh, the appeal court, rules in favor of the motion. Uh, what happens next? I think we will have answered in parts, but uh, here's from somebody who's now joined us. The article itself says, if the, the question is asked, if the court of appeal rules in favor of the motion, the... Um, the section itself says that there is no appeal, but uh, that would be such a dire situation that you would have to move the CCJ to determine what the next step would be. Now, there is some sort of precedent for this kind of, not, not specifically this, uh -huh. but the um, Constitution says that laws which were passed before the constitution came into force are saved from unconstitutionality. And the CCJ in a number of cases, one from Barbados and one from Vienna, said notwithstanding that, where, where unconstitutional action happens and fundamental rights are breached, the court will go behind that section to see whether those laws are unconstitutional or not. So even where the constitution says something very specific, preventing the court from taking action, the court still said, this is such a serious situation. We are going to take action. So you do have that. Absolutely, dear. And uh, is that your view too, uh, Mr. Ram? Yes. Um, you, you know, there are several sets of uh, uh, articles in the Constitution, like, for example, the, the 226 there, Commission is not subject to the duration of control of any other person. I, I, I also want to raise paragraph or one of the affidavit. That I'm far advised by May, Ms. May Robinson, so I'm very believe that the meaning of more votes cast, apparently they don't know what it means, in Article 177.2 of the Constitution 
has to be consumed in the light of the order number 60. Now that is putting the the cart before the donkey. Mm-hmm. Is the con the order has to be consistent with the constitution, not the constitution consistent with the order. I don't know who she well, she said she was advised by Mayor Robinson. And um you look at these orders. Which order can the court give? Mm-hmm. An order that there be an interpretation of the words more votes cast? How does that mean? That's, that's a declaration? Uh, we will return three or four arguments again. That, that's, <laughs> that's the same kind of thing you need. So, I am hopeful that the, that the Court of Appeal will do what, in my view, is the right and obvious thing to do, is to throw this thing out of the courtroom and put a hefty fine on Mayor Robertson. He is a party to, to, to this whole business of attempting, of the attempt to destroy democracy and order in this country. We can't tolerate it. And I, I would hope that given its own recent experiences, the Court of Appeal will, will realize its almost unique duty in these circumstances to take a stand and to say to Claude Singh, my sister, you go and do the work that you have you've been appointed to do by the president and the leader of the opposition and that you've sworn to do under the oath you have taken when you assume the office of chairman of the Elections Commission. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, you? Yes, thank you. My apologies. I somehow got uh, quite a hit there. <laughs> but, um, Chris, I want to come to you first with this uh, and then come up. Um, what will Chris Ram say now, tonight, to the APNO AFC supporters? Um, I would say to them, that they should not be misled by the noises in their party. I don't believe that every single person in the APNU or the AFC is wild and reckless. Yes, there are some leading ones. So we'll, we'll have to hope that people are guided by their better inner angels um, they're going to say, look, if we play a game of cricket and we don't like the results, what we do? We didn't like how we lost. You say, okay, I'll go, I'll learn my lessons, and I'll be better. One ha- Nobody has bothered to realize how poor a job APNU has done. I don't want to call any names on, on that side. But one person told me, who's making noise, said, you know something, we did a terrible job. And what the supporters are doing, they want, they have every right to want to see their party. Why, whatever reason they support the party for, they have every right to see that that party return to power. But they have to be realistic. If this is how they... APNU, AFC arrangement is going to conduct itself, then it is not helping its electoral chances come 2025 and beyond. Who is going to support them with this one seat majority that the PPP has? You know, the specter of a no confidence motion will always hang over the National Assembly. But who will want to get into any alliance with the APNU, when you know that when they have power, they have no regard for anyone else or the constitution or the country. They trample everything. It's a scorched policy. And you know, there's another not worrying to, thing to you, um, gentlemen, is not, us not having a very strong opposition at this point in time, especially when we have oil and gas now. That is a deeply worrying thing. I see we've been discussing it, but nobody's really looking at that, not having a strong opposition. 
Correct. Correct. Uh, but come on, I want to throw that same thing at, at you, um, you know, uh, while Chris and I might be of, of the older generation, you're of the younger generation, you and Leonard, uh, Leonard, make you a good there, boy. Uh, but come on, what would you say to, to, to younger professionals um, that would at this stage still be holding on to the APNU ASC um, uh, narrative, um, refusing to, to read and see logic and, and illogic in their narrative, what would you as a younger professional tell them? No, you know, Yog, I have seen a lot of young professionals who are APNU supporters. They've gone silent on Facebook because they do not agree with what is happening. And I hope that people like those young people will go into the party and take it over and make a change. When yeah. the no-confidence motion was passed and the president Mr. Granger and Mr. Nagamutu said that they would abide by it and they would follow the law. I felt to myself that Guyana has become a different country. I thought, here we are. This, we have now moved on. We're going to follow the law and elections are going to be held in accordance with the constitution. And I thought, finally, here we are in a country where one party can be removed from government, another party comes in. If that party doesn't perform properly, it's removed. And so, the two parties, the two main parties, have to then satisfy the people of the country in order to stay in government. I thought mm -hmm. they finally arrived at that stage. But apparently I was completely wrong. And I hope, I, I live in this country, I have a little daughter, she's just six months old. I hope that we can live in this country. And this country can be a place where things work. So right. I hope that we can one day arrive at a place where the, the parties take people of the country into consideration and just do things that make the country work and make the people happy. So, so Chris, would something like this matter to the court when they are ready to, to have their session tomorrow? On March 7th, March 7th, 2020, despite a headline, I'm reading to you a headline, despite injunction and pending court ruling, Lowenfield prepares final report on election results. This is on March 7th, the same year. And today's headline, Lowenfield refuses to submit elections report after receiving mere notice of court proceedings. Well, you see, I think these are calculated acts by Lowenfield. He has his so-called higher authority whose interests he has to serve. Lowenfield, probably like Mingo, believes that they're untouchable, that they can do what they want. Um, unfortunately, the matter before the court tomorrow is very narrow, and I suspect the court, as always, will be ever so careful in just pronouncing on the issues um, before it, which really are fluff as contained in Mr. Robertson's um, pleadings. I want to say one thing quickly. Mm -hmm. We talked about how our country had moved on. You know, in 51 years, we had only changed government once. In five years, we changed twice. That's a tribute to the intelligence of the electorate of this country. But what mm -hmm. has happened? After that show of democracy, after that demonstration of hope, Granger said, I am above the National Assembly, the no confidence motion, and I am above the people of this country, the electorate. I don't care what the hell you have done. He said at, at um, Green Oak, you've elected me for five years and I will be president for five years. In other words, he did not respect the no confidence motion just like he is not respecting the electorate. He didn't respect the, the judgment of the chief justice. He said that's our view, and he has his. Granger believes he is God. Thank you, Chris. Kamal, we are getting down to program time, and I would want to ask you for your closing comments tonight, because tomorrow will be a very interesting day. I hope tomorrow is not another damn squib, Leonard. But Kamal, what are your closing comments tonight, sir? 
hoping you know, that, that this is going to end that the Aknu AFC is going to say we still have a chance we still have a chance to win next time if we don't keep going on this path you know where they're going they're going towards a dictatorship now you, when you get there can't turn back they still have a chance to say let's concede let's give up let's rebuild and we start again from tomorrow uh, a ppp government is not the end of the world elections will happen in 5 years again and they have another chance to get back into power so mm-hmm. i keep hoping and i'm optimistic that that some sense will come to them Th- there doesn't seem to be anybody in the country or in the world who is in support of what is happening and i hope that sense will arrive at some point in time and they will concede and give up and come again to fight another day thank you And Chris, just one uh, last question for you, and please add it to your closing thoughts. Um, uh, technically, I mean, with with the law behind you, sir, and come on, feel free to join. But with the law behind you, Mr. Irfan Ali, his five years, the PPP's five years, did it start on March third, or will it start when he is declared, when they're declared? It's certainly not March third, and Parliament will have five years from the time it first meets. I think that's right, isn't it, Kamal? Yes, yes, yes. It's, it hasn't happened as yet. The, the Afno UFC is still a government, whether they are holding on as a de facto government or not. Okay, thanks. Chris, your final comment, sir. Well, you know, I witness the personal aspects of this thing today. Our airports are closed, but Ramon McRae has a number of young staff. We have a. I am three times the average age of the staff. and you know when you see the the uncertainty and the disappointment and the the hopelessness so in thinking about all the legal issues and the political parties and the nation we are playing with people's lives you're playing with young people you're telling young people look don't don't bother with this country because you're not sure come the next elections that you won't be the victim of violence you're not sure that you're not going to be regardless of which government that you're not going to be prejudiced and discriminated against so we talk about the the maturity i talk about the maturity of our people but the maturity of our politicians leaves a tremendous lot to be desired thank you thank you chris thank you kamal it's been good to have you both here today mr Senior journalist Mr. Leonard Gildari. Tomorrow you have elections. What's at one thirty, sir? Yes, sir. And it's going to be. Uh, we are going to be looking specifically at that court case tomorrow. And of course, uh, so you have a court watch. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be. Well, we've been watching for for the longest while, and uh, it's just uh, we are. But you know, Leonard, I want to interject to say this thing is going beyond an elections watch. Now you're on a wake. We're yeah. having a wake every day. <laughs> And, and uh, Chris, Chris, uh, we're gonna have Chris back. I'm not sure when he's gonna say enough is enough and take a vacation when our borders are closed. But tomorrow is gonna be a very critical day because uh, it is that court case, and we'd have to see where it goes. But um, uh, I, I don't believe, based on what we're hearing from uh, the two esteemed counsel there, uh, that this thing is gonna be over tomorrow. And as the court says, uh, absolutely, um, uh, it's gonna end it right there, and we we're not sure how this is gonna play out. Such a critical case. and so many things is hanging in balance here but well, we're going to be looking at that uh, very clearly um and see how that goes from there but we don't expect this thing to be over tomorrow so we're going to mm-hmm. be with you with elections maybe covid or a week or whatever you want to call it for the next mm-hmm. couple of days thank you thank you Leonard and i would like to ask um, both councils on screen to please entertain a citizens action calling for redress calling for something from the courts of Guyana or something we have to do something we just can't allow one side to continue to hold this country at ransom while children cannot have a meal to eat while covid is ravaging some people some are are in their fancy offices and fancy vehicles while mr granger is planning on god knows what tomorrow or next day ladies and gentlemen it's been good to have you in room 590 but i must remind you the outcome of these elections may be decided in the courts tomorrow but the outcome of a future of guyana rests in your hands ladies and gentlemen i wish to urge each and every one of us in this program and those who will listen to it later 
regardless of how tempted you might be. There is no call for action other than to be smart, to be polite, and to be reserved in expressing yourself. Do not, I repeat, do not be agitated to the point where you are going to become part of any action. Let us allow the courts to do their thing. We have waited, as Kamal said, as Chris said, we have waited for a hundred odd days. Let us wait a couple of days more. It is a waiting game. But this country is ours, and we need to continue to remind the politicians it is not theirs for the taking. It is ours for the making. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been good to have you on 592 once again. And hopefully, certainly, we're going to see you tomorrow at Elections Watch and tomorrow night in room 592. Stay good. Do a prayer for this lovely country of ours. Yes, it is still a lovely country, the best place to be on Mother Earth. I love you all, and God bless Guyana, and have a great night. Bye-bye now. Thank you.